right? Our goal is to only allow one mass unit through, the smallest window as possible. So I need something that's going to filter out the big ones. So let's look at the negative rods. You could probably do this now if you think about it yourself. Just the same principles I've been talking about. So I'm going to connect this to a DC current that's negative. Huh? And again, the positive ones would be like here and here. The negative ones would be here and here. I'd love to open that up and show it to you. But this is in a different plane. Okay, so this is a three-dimensional thing. I'm showing you two dimensions, but it's a three-dimensional thing. If it was just negative, with just the DC current, what would happen? So I got my little speedboat ion, and I got my Titanic ion. How are they going to move through? So let's take the Titanic again. What is the general motion of these babies now? Negative, positive. If that's all I had, nothing would get through. Right? That'd be a pretty stupid filter. <laughs> it filters everything out. Right? <laughs> that doesn't work. So what we're going to do is add the alternating current to it, just like we did over there. So let's add the alternating current. And let's start at negative, ramp it up to positive until the positive overcomes that, and then these rods turn positive. And then they turn negative, and then they turn positive, and then they turn negative, and then it's alternating. Right? So what happens to the motion of these ions as they move through this alternating field of, of current. Let's take the big one. Remember, can't turn its path very fast. Its general path is towards the rod. Remember, here, its path was through the rods. Here, because they're negative, it wants to move towards the rods at all times until this turns positive. So watch what happens. They're, po they're negative, right? Alternating current's negative. You've got a big, massive Titanic moving in this direction, hard to turn. Now it turns positive. AC turns positive, overwhelms that. What happens when this turns positive? Repulse, and it goes Ooh, it's positive. Turn, turn about, turn about, turn about. Ooh, that was close. Oh, fuel is negative. Oh, crap, now it's positive again. And then it's negative and it crashes. Because its general path is this direction, so even when this turns positive, it's hard to turn. And then it turns negative again, and then it turns positive and it crashes and burns. The big ones get taken out. Let's take the speedboat. General direction is this way. Negative, very attracted, negative, very attracted. Oh, it's positive. You know, you can turn it on a dime, right? And then all of a sudden it's negative again. Woo! That's positive. That's negative. That's positive. Boom! Out it goes. Right? Because you're on the or like a ski do, right? You're heading through, and all of a sudden I'm heading towards you because I'm positive, you're negative. Then you're positive. I just go shoot. We're a skier, and then I'm attracted, and then I'm repulsed, and you can get right through. So the little ones get through, and the big ones don't. I killed it. Low mass filter. Okay. So if we did a graph like that one over there. For the low mass filter, let's do our mass to charge ratio, number of ions that get through, based on the voltage that I set, and I can scale them through, I can ramp the voltages and pick whatever mass to charge ratio I want. Anything above that is removed. Okay? So the positive rods remove everything below a certain value, the negative rods remove everything above a certain value. With the combination of the two in two different dimensions, Instead of a motion like this, the motion is like this. It's a spiral. So either it's going to spiral out of control, right, or it will spiral right through. With the combination, if I take these two graphs and put them together, I'm going to measure the mass to charge ratios from zero to some value, and the number of ions that get through, the high mass filter will wipe out everything below a certain value. The low mass filter will wipe out everything above a certain value, and I have a window that's the only mass to charge ratio that gets through. So my goal is to have the smallest window possible, right? Maybe one Dalton or atomic mass unit or less. There's some mass spectrometers, if you're willing to spend enough money, can get it to several decimal places. You can actually separate isotopes. That's how sensitive it is. It's amazing. And what I'll do is I'm going to change the ratio of the AC to DC voltage to maximize the, the device, and I'll ramp it from low to high. So I will scan, I'll put my window here first and measure that, right? And I'm going to get a mass spectrum from this. Now based on the fragments, nothing has that mass to charge ratio. So when that window is here, not, I don't see anything. I don't detect any ions. And then I ramp up the voltage, and I'm going to have my window here. I detect nothing. And then I do it here. I detect nothing. And then I do it here. I'm scaling through all, I'm scanning through all the mass to charge ratios. 
And all of a sudden, I get to that mass. Boop, I get a peak. Well, I got something there. Something, something got through. And I'll scale all the way through, and you'll probably something see something akin to this. Right? You may see some peaks on either side of it based on isotope differences, different number of neutrons and whatnot. This is called your mass spectrum. So you get your peak area or number of ions. This is your mass to charge ratio coming through. I think you've seen that already, haven't you? So you get your chromatogram. You can right click on a peak and it gives you the mass spectrum for species A or species B or species D. These are your fragments, right? This is probably your molecular peak. That's the original molecule that came out. But because of fragmentation, that may not be the most dominant ion that comes through. Maybe it's this fragment or this fragment. That's the one that's most. So you'll have your base peak over here. That's the one that comes out the most, but you'll still have a molecular peak there, which is the original uh, atomic weight, right? So from this, you can analyze what each piece is. That will tell you their identities. If you have to figure out the old way, you could put this back together. But now you just right click, do a spectral search, library search, and tell you this is your molecule. This is toluene, this is ethyl benzene, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So very, very simple ideas. Electrostatic repulsion and attraction, bigger ones don't turn as readily as smaller ones, and you can explain one of the higher level analytical techniques that they use in high level research to a seventh grader. I, I would think, right? Not that you're going to, right? And you're not going to go, hey, let me teach you how mass spectrometers work, right? But if you're teaching electrostatic repulsion and attraction, in a lecture, you could say, hey, you know what? I was over at UCI for a couple weeks with the big dogs, right? And I was working on this machine doing these analysis. And the detection device it was worked on just those basic, just a simple principle like I'm teaching you now. These high-tech devices worked on just that. You could, I, I would think, a seventh grader would understand this, right? Repulsed or attracted. I don't know if they would get this motion. I don't know. Would they? Would they get the that the big one would crash and the little one? They probably get that. You could explain a.